Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. I just released just a few days ago our extra show, our bonus broadcast for the month of February. Those are fun to do. There are many ways to support this broadcast, and I'm so thankful for the support. Of course, the support via our sponsors. You know, if you use the sponsors, audible.com and Casper Mattresses and HelloFresh and the great courses and stamps.com. I'm so thankful that they are supporters of this show. It's really pretty remarkable that they do support the broadcast. They weren't scared off by a podcast called The Thinking Atheist. And, uh, you know, I think they're great organizations and I'm glad to have their support. But the patrons get a completely commercial free version of the show. They get their own private RSS feed via Patreon. So they get an ad free broadcast. And then they also, for their support of any amount, they get an extra show every month. And the flavor of those broadcasts is a lot different. It's a lot looser. It's a lot more casual. We just hang out. You know, the host is doing his thing. I'm just kind of vamping. And and we open the switchboard and see whatever our callers have to say, whatever they want to talk about. You never know where the show is going to take you. And so that's been a lot of fun. And we just released the February broadcast a few days ago. And if you want to be a supporter, we have, I think, there are 500 or so right now supporting on Patreon. And I'm so grateful for you. Uh, you can do a buck a month, you can whatever. You know, if the show brings benefit to you and you want to support the show, you in return will get a completely ad free broadcast and the extra show every single month. Just go to patreon.com slash Seth Andrews. Now I'm rolling the dice a little bit with this particular week's offerings, okay? Politics is so polarizing, politics is tough. People are talking about it, but also they don't want to hear about it. People are engaged, but they're also burned out and worn out and exhausted and exasperated. You talk politics, it's almost in some ways worse than talking religion. People just divide and start throwing stones at each other. But while this broadcast has atheist in the title, and we talk tons about atheism, the rejection of religious belief, the rejection of the supernatural, various religions and cults, talk about science and those types of things. Our current political climate relates to secular values, the embracing of science and reason and rationality in an often crazy and superstitious world, in an unreasonable world. And so I'm offering up over the next three days, three politically charged pieces of content. Okay. Today's broadcast is going to be a panel discussion that discusses Donald Trump's America. Joining me on the panel, I'm going to have Larry Decker. He is the executive director for the SCA, the Secular Coalition for America. I had Sarah Levin on the docket. I've interviewed her several times. She's fantastic. And she had a last-second conflict, and she had to take a train to some sort of a presentation somewhere. So Larry's going to pinch it for her. Andrew Seidel is a friend and an attorney. He works for the FFRF, the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Stephen Newton is a geologist and a representative of the National Center for Science Education. The NCSE has a lot of amazing information on their website. And Andrew Torres is a fellow broadcaster. He's an attorney, but he hosts or co-hosts the opening arguments show. Now I thought, well, let's just get these people all around the round table. Let's just get them talking and let's see what happens. I mean, we have a lot to talk about in the political climate we have, especially regarding the anti-science, anti-reason, often anti-secularism and anti-atheist positions being taken by so many of these appointees, so many of these people being placed in positions of power. We got to figure out what's going on and what to do about it. That's what today's show is. Tomorrow, I'm releasing a secular State of the Union address. Tomorrow is normally the date that the president would give the State of the Union. It's an annual speech. Now, I don't see reported that Trump is doing an official State of the Union address. Many first-year presidents or some first-year presidents will just skip the first-year State of the Union altogether because they just got into office. 
So I'm not seeing the State of the Union address as the title for the presentation that Donald Trump is giving this week. Now, he's still giving a speech. I mean, it's the same format of speech. He's giving a speech to a joint session of Congress broadcast on international television. So whether they call it the State of the Union or not, and the media outlets might be, I don't know. Uh, we're going to give, I'm going to give a secular State of the Union address tomorrow. That's going to be the whole broadcast. Instead of a top-down speech, I'm going to do just an everyday guy's speech. A secular citizen waxing on about the State of of the union. So I'm curious to see how that's going to go over, but it's broadcasting tomorrow. So you get two shows this week. And then on Wednesday, I'm going to release a four minute video that I would like to see forwarded to every single Christian who voted for Donald Trump. We're going to examine some of the best verses of the Christian Bible, and we're going to contrast those verses against the life, the words, the actions, the legacy of our new president. I would like to see Christians watch the video and sort of answer many of the questions posed by the video. I'm going to release it in two formats. One's going to be on the Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And then for those who don't want to forward it with atheist in the title because they're afraid it won't be watched in the first place, I'm going to go ahead and upload it to my Seth Andrews Facebook page and have a Facebook version with different tags on Facebook. So if you don't want the thinking atheist to be something they'll see first off and then they shut down and say, forget it, I'm not going to watch it, you can forward it from Seth Andrews and they'll say, hey, who's this Andrews guy? And they'll click the video and hopefully four minutes later we'll say, hmm... You know, and then maybe we'll see exactly what these people are thinking. So it's a three-day political thing. Bear with me. After this, we're going to get back into the science of the brain. We're going to talk to an ex-scientologist. We're going to do some explorations into miracles. We've got a very busy month of March planned for you that's not about politics, I promise, okay? Joining me for a panel discussion on a broadcast called Trump's America, I've got Steve Newton. He's a geologist and a representative for the National Center for Science Education. Steve, great to have you, my friend. Hello. Thank you for having me. I had Sarah Levin scheduled. She's the senior legislative representative for the SCA, the Secular Coalition for America. She had a scheduling conflict. And so Larry Decker is here and he is representing the SCA. He's the executive director. Larry, it's great to have you on the radio today, my friend. It's great to be here. And although I have a bigger title, Sarah's still my boss. Uh, she <laughs> and probably will do a better job than me. But uh, Seth, always good to be with you. Glad you're here. Andrew Seidel is an attorney for the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Andrew, it's great to talk to you again, my friend. Always a pleasure. Thank you for having me on, Seth. And then Andrew Torres. He is an attorney and he's co-host from the Opening Arguments podcast. Andrew, thanks for being a part of the panel today. It's great to have you. Thank you very much for having me on. Well, I'm going to ask a favor because I have four of you. It's uh, sort of worked out that we have all male voices and some may have a hard time distinguishing, including myself here as we get into these conversations. So when you jump in, if any period of time has passed, let me know who I'm listening to. All right. Sort of introduce <laughs> yourself again. Hey, this is Andrew. Hey, this is Steve. Hey, this is Larry. OK. Do you, since there's two Andrews who are both attorneys, do you want us to just do like thing one and thing two? God, you're complicating my life, people. I mean, we just got started already. We're blurring the lines. I can, I can, I'm happy to be Torres on this. <laughs> Larry, I'll start with you. You know, it's funny when I put this conversation together, I thought I want to talk about things that are relevant. At the same time, when you talk politics, you have this internal monologue, like how many listeners do I want to lose today? How many people do you want to unsubscribe today? There is a fatigue going on out there from just the insanity that's come down, the political disagreement, the divisions and whatnot. But there's also a level of urgency that I have never seen before. I mean, it in many ways hasn't died down after the election. We thought, ah, some of this stuff will pass. But that really hasn't been the case. What's your perspective, Larry? I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I think that there are a lot of people who perhaps thought that Mr. Trump, when he was on the campaign trail, was, you know, just spouting off rhetoric that would help him achieve votes. And now that he's putting a lot of these things into action, people are getting scared and they're saying, wait, you know, we like you for a lot of reasons, but we really didn't want you to do that. And you have people on the right and people on the left who are coming out in droves, basically saying, uh, we need to put the brakes on here. Uh, this is not the direction that we want to go. I mean, we see it in the polls. We see it in the reactions to members of Congress who are 
currently at home in their districts for a district work period, meeting with constituents. Uh, you know, CNN, I think every lead of this week has been uh, about a town hall gone awry. And people are scared, and for a good reason. We went through the confirmation process of so many of Donald Trump's nominees for the cabinet, and uh, there were a lot of contentious debates that happened, also for a good reason. So, you know, we've been out, and I can tell you this much, last year, in, in the entire year, we sent 27,500 letters to Congress. This year, we've already sent over 20,000. So all of 2016, the members and the constituents of the Secular Coalition for America sent 27,000. We've already, in the first two months, sent over 20,000. Now, these are what, um, it, letters to elected representatives saying, we're against this bill, we are for this policy? Exactly. Letters of concern, letters of support. People are, you know, they're energized because they're concerned, and they have a good reason to be concerned. I mean, this administration is using the power of the executive branch to wage an, an entire war on science uh, that we haven't seen in decades. Andrew Torres, you're a radio host. You catching any shit from pro-Trump people who say, hey, wait a minute. You know, there are many of us who are atheists or who are non-believers or who are skeptics or who are pro-science who are also pro-Trump. What's your problem? You catching some of that out there? Yeah, I actually get it from both sides. Um, one of the things that I, I like that Larry just said is that there is a tremendous amount of energy right now. Uh, but one of the things that I try and do is make sure that that energy is focused in a direction that's productive, right? Because right now there's a lot of misinformation on both sides. There's a lot of energy sort of being spent by those of us who are secular, who are progressive, where there are, you know, there's misinformation and fake news and, you know, people taking advantage of uh, kind of the disbelief. Um, so, you know, two examples of that that sort of immediately come to mind are the, I don't know if you've seen this, you know, Revote 2017, where there is a, uh, there actually is a petition for mandamus before the Supreme Court. But what people don't realize is that that just means that a document was filed. Right? Uh, and these people have raised, you know, like $25,000 on the backs of we're going to get the election overturned and there's going to be a new vote and we're going to kick out both Trump and Pence. And, and uh, it, 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 that's not going to happen. And right? we'll all live happily <laughs> yeah, ever right. after. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, you know, look, I mean, I share the views of you know, I didn't vote for Trump. I was out there sort of loudly and, and <laughs> um, you know, urging folks to vote the other way uh, prior to the election. But the kind of, you know, sort of disbelief of uh, we can undo this and make it all happen the other way. The, the, the other area where I took sort of a lot of grief from folks who were allies was uh, when former Green Party candidate Jill Stein had a petition for recounts in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. And, and under the law, I mean, it was just crystal clear that she was not going to be able to get a recount in Michigan, th that the law requires you to have standing, which means that the outcome of the election could change based on your request for you as the candidate. And she was at 1% in Michigan pre-recount. She was going to be 1% after the recount. It was, it was just clear it was going to be used as a fundraising device. And that's what the Green Party did. They raised $7 million. And I was out there saying, hey, look, you know, I, I want to fight Trump as much as anybody. Let's spend your money in ways that are productive and let's organize at the grassroots level and let's get out there and, um, and you know, sort of decipher through the kind of uh, apply the same level of skepticism that we encourage in every other area to some of these claims of we're going to throw out the election and, uh, you know, redo everything. So I'll let either one of the Andrews speak to this, OK, <laughs> Torres or Seidel. But there are a lot of those change.org type petitions out there, you know. We're signing a petition to reverse the election. We're signing a petition to have a recount. We're signing a petition, petition, petition. And, of course, the argument becomes they become a needle in a stack of needles. Just because you file a petition doesn't mean anyone reads or, or sees the petition. You go to whitehouse.gov and do this. And I don't know what merit do online petitions have. Well, this is Andrew Seidel. 
I think they're not terribly effective, or at least they're not a good use of an individual who wants to get involved and who wants to become an activist. They're not a good use of their time. There are many more things that you could be doing. Joining SCA, joining FFRF, signing up for action alerts from either one of our groups where you'll get notifications. This is what Larry was talking about with the tens of thousands of letters that have been sent in. You'll get notifications about bad bills that are coming up. And you'll be able to actually write to your representative. With that is going to have a bigger impact than signing an online petition. Uh, so I think it's just not a necessarily – it's an easy thing to do. And I think it makes people feel good afterwards. But it's not going to have the change that I think people are wanting. And there's the danger of abuse, which Andrew Torres was just talking about. This is Larry. I just I want to underscore what Andrew Torres just said and Andrew Seidel just underscored. And that is we need to harness – the energy that we have out there currently in the right place. It's away from the fake news. It's away from just signing a petition. It's actually being engaged and becoming an activist the way that Andrew Seidel just said. So I, I feel like I'm going to say Andrew, 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 <laughs> uh, about you know, 20 times on this call, and I apologize for it. But, uh, you know, with that said, I think it's incredibly important that we focus and we really do harness that energy because there's so many things that can be accomplished. And I'll say this much from the secular coalition standpoint this year at the federal level, we don't expect to get a lot through that we really want, but we expect to block a lot of stuff. And the only way that we can block stuff from actually happening is if we're harnessing that energy the same way that Andrew Seidel was just talking about by getting people to write to their members, calling their members uh, and being very engaged. So um, that sounds like a you. campaign slogan for the midterms, you know, harness the energy 2018. I kind of like that. You know, somebody make up a bumper sticker. You know, <laughs> so I'm somebody... on it. I'm on it. Okay, <laughs> uh, I'll do it. <laughs> Steve Newton is a geologist and a rep for the uh, NCSE, the National Center for Science Education. I wanted some science involved here, my friend. Just Ooh. I mean, are you wearing all black? Is every day <laughs> a day of mourning for you, Steve Newton, as you read sort of the anti-science headlines coming down? The anti-science culture has been around for a long time. This is sort of a, uh, an expression of it sort of reaching its zenith of power, but it's, it's been there underlined for a long time. We've seen especially a lot of state action. The national level with, with science and with science education is less important than what's going on in state legislatures with passing bills that they like to call Academic Freedom Acts which are meant to give cover to creationist teachers to bring in what they call alternatives to the science. It's kind of like an alt-fact thing. So that's certainly something that we're seeing a, a lot happen. There's bills in Oklahoma, Texas, Indiana. There was a bill in South Dakota called SB 55, which was just defeated in the Education Committee, thankfully. And um, historically, most of these sort of anti-science state bills end up that way, that they die in committee. Uh, but there are a few, such as in, in Louisiana and Tennessee, that have been passed. And these, uh, these at that local level, at the teacher in the classroom level, give cover to creationist teachers. Now, Betsy DeVos at the national level is not going to determine the curriculum that's going into local schools. So as bad as her statements are, they probably aren't going to influence science education directly that much. The statements that she believes education exists to advance God's kingdom, that kind of thing. Well, in her Senate hearings, she mentioned the idea of critical thinking, which is used in a lot of these anti-science bills to uh, sort of give the cover of saying we're going to bring to students in all the classrooms more information, not less information. And uh, that's kind of a, an appealing rhetoric. But what it means is bringing in non-scientific information into the science classroom. Interesting that you speak about giving cover or enabling the yes. uh, state governments and the theocrats. Here in Oklahoma, we just had a, a guy named Joseph Silk. He proposed the Oklahoma Right of Conscience Act. It's one of these religious conscience or personal conscience pieces of legislation, which says that a person can deny service if they find it a moral affront. And of right. course, this is positioned under state sovereignty as the right of a free citizen to be true to their own moral compass kind of thing. And, of course, you and I see it for what it is. It opens the door for evangelicals to deny service based on sex, based on gender, based on whatever they deem immoral or whatever makes them uncomfortable. And you're seeing yeah. this not just in Oklahoma, but in many other states of the union, correct? Yeah, absolutely. We're seeing in Idaho, for instance, climate change being removed from the state science standards. 
We think that the Trump era is going to really encourage a lot of anti-science activity at the local level, since that is where education is really occurring. And it's going to encourage individual teachers to bring things into the classroom that are not part of the science curriculum under the aegis of bringing in critical thinking. I just wanted to ask Stephen a question. Uh, This is Andrew Torres. One of the questions that was brought to me was a concern about data collection at the EPA. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, in other words, there's longitudinal climate data that is being collected and there's massive amounts of it. It's stored on servers. And because the EPA is an executive agency, you have whoever uh, is in charge of the EPA has discretionary authority as to how to spend the money. And so the concern was that they could just defund some of the server farms and that then that literally generations of data could be lost that's uh, you know sort of crucial to uh, establishing uh, the you know ongoing scientific information on long-term global climate change and I was just curious if you'd heard anything about that if you know there are any efforts what we can do with respect to that historical data. Well, I think in terms of what we can do, um, every scientist would know the value of uh, backing up data in multiple places. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, the defunding of, especially in the earth sciences, which is, is my field, geology, is really a problem. The earth sciences are often funded through NASA. And there's talk of NASA basically shutting down most of its funding for the earth sciences, which includes mm-hmm. climate change and that sort of uh, research. So uh, my colleagues who are dependent on those grants and dependent on those grants to fund their graduate students are, um, I mean, there's a state of anxiety like I've never seen. Anybody else want to weigh in on anything we've said before I move on? I would. This is Larry Decker from the Secular Coalition for America. Just a, a couple of quick things. One, I think, you know, Steve is absolutely right. So much of what we deal with on a daily basis happens at the state level. And we've had almost kind of a, a nice little privilege over the last few years of having the kind of blockage that we've had in D.C. with a Republican House and a Republican Senate and a Democratic president that nothing was really funneling through the federal system so we could put a lot of our energy in what was happening at the state level. And now that we have, um, and, and I don't say this because I'm preferential to one party or another. I mean, I'm a Democrat. I'm open about that. But I, I started my career working for the chairman of the Science Committee in the U.S. House, uh, Congressman Sherwood Bullard, uh, who is my hometown congressman. He was a Republican, however, that believed in science, and uh, it's good to have those kind of people. My point being, though, is that we have, for the last several years, had a blockage at the federal level, so so much was happening at the state level. But now we have this perfect storm of the Republican trifecta, if you will, at the federal level, and we also have you know state governments that we have to be concerned about. So this is a really big issue. The one thing that the Secular Coalition is doing about it, though, that I I do want to mention is creating something called rapid response teams. And we're doing that by mobilizing our supporters in states across the country to attend town halls with their representatives when they come home, but also to receive immediate text messages and action alerts from us so that they can take the first line of defense when something new comes out. And I think it's incredibly important that we have people on the ground, and there are ways that all of your listeners could get involved, even if they've never done anything with the Secular Coalition for America in the past, that I think would be beneficial to all of us in exactly the things that Steve was just talking about at the state level, but also the challenges that we're facing at the federal level. Is that the SCA mascot I heard barking in the background there? I, I, I thought I heard that. Uh, I, I am actually at home, and that was my dog, Dexter, so I apologize. <laughs> all right. The more, the merrier. You know, the right. More, the merrier. Yeah, That's no. all right. He's uh, a good right. people. I got a couple <laughs> little rat dogs here, and they've ruined more than one take, you know, and, and they're, they're kind of attention hogs. Go figure. Uh, let's get into some of the specific challenges. Let's talk about Betsy DeVos for just a few. Can someone profile why we oppose the DeVos appointment? Yeah, this is Andrew Torres. Um 
my biggest concern with Betsy DeVos is not the more inflammatory statements and rhetoric that came out at her hearing. Obviously, that's disturbing. But her appointment signals, I think, very clearly that the Trump administration is going to try and implement a federal voucher system and that um, we did an episode on this. It is despite the fact that what a voucher system does is provide essentially a tax break to people who take their kids out of public school. Right. And we know what a tax break does. Right. It it incentivizes behavior. So it will encourage people to pull their kids out of public schools, put them into private schools, including religious schools that offer, you know, straight creationist education. Uh, Some voucher programs provide that for homeschooling, which has little to no oversight in a lot of states. And there is a Supreme Court decision that essentially provides the roadmap to make that happen. So, you know, that's an area where uh, hopefully we can get in again and sort of channel activism because, you know, the mantra of school choice sounds good, but essentially what it is is a a tax break for people to opt out of our public system of education. And that's, uh, to me, that's the most horrifying thing about Betsy DeVos. DeVos doesn't have a background in any sense in education, correct? (laughs) Correct. None. You know, never spend Correct. a day in the classroom, which I think you know should be a, a, a just the base criteria for being in that position. Salon just published an article, which the general gist was that this is strategic. The people, it's like Scott Pruitt's appointment as environmental protection head, a guy who has brought 14 lawsuits whose emails reveal close ties with the fossil fuel industry, bringing in people who have in the past attacked the agencies that they are now being appointed to lead. And the narrative is that this is sort of a dismantling. Trump wants to just take these agencies apart piece by piece. Is there merit to that? I think there is absolutely merit to that. And I think what Andrew Torres is talking about with the vouchers actually backs that up in a way that a lot of people maybe don't understand. Vouchers are not really about private school choice. Um, Well, first, I think people should know that vouchers don't work. We know they don't work. Uh, Here in Wisconsin, we've had them in Milwaukee for a number of years. They hurt public schools, and they actually, the New York Times just had an excellent article citing three different studies that have come out that show that they hurt students. Um, So the students who take vouchers do worse than the students who don't take vouchers. But the thing about vouchers that people don't realize is that There is this underlying idea behind them, and I think Betsy DeVos embodies this in a way that hasn't been talked about enough, which is that you can also use them to destroy the public school system, which I think is what you're talking about, Seth, you know, tearing everything down, getting rid of the administrative state. And it's not talked about enough, but there is this push on the religious right to undermine public schools to the greatest extent possible. And a $20 billion voucher scheme, which has been floated by the Trump administration, is one way that can really do that. And it would, I mean, you're four years, possibly eight years of that. That's a lot of children's education and a huge impact for the foreseeable future. So it is something that I think Andrew Torres is absolutely right. We need to come out strongly against this. And it's got to be, as Larry said, one of those things that we really do stop. Agency by, I mean, Ben Carson, right? It's a pediatric, a retired pediatric neurosurgeon with no experience with housing. I mean, none being appointed to head housing and urban development. You got Rick Perry at Energy. You know, this is the same guy that once tried to pray his state out of a horrible drought. You know, Not just a drought, but but fires. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, Seth, I, th- I think you're actually on a point here. I mean, it, it's not just Betsy DeVos being someone who has been opposed to the Department of, Ener- uh, of Education for so long. You know, Tom Price, former congressman from Georgia, who's now the head of HHS, who's opposed to Obamacare. And I say Obamacare, but it's really the Affordable Care Act. I mean, let's call it for what it really is. Senator Jeff Sessions, now the the new attorney general. You mentioned Governor Rick Perry of Texas becoming the head of the uh, energy department. I mean, we have countless numbers of people who are actually out there that are just the, the task of leading the agency where their mission is at odds with their own proposed ideology. And that's what we have. It's almost like a dismantling of the federal government from top to bottom as quickly as we possibly can. 
It's almost like saying, who is the person who is most against the agency? That's who I'm going to appoint to lead it. Yeah, I, I think it, it really, we could just call this trolling. It, it's almost as if it, it, it's, it's intentional that way. Well, and I mean, Perry is probably the perfect example of that. Everybody remembers when he forgot that the one of the agencies that he would get rid of, <laughs> the Department of Energy was one of the agencies he would get rid of. I mean, you know. The guy who's leading it right now, or was, is a Stanford physicist. Before that, you had an MIT Nobel Prize winner, and Rick Perry lost Dancing with the Stars. Right? This is <laughs> this is nuts. Let's talk about Jeff Sessions for just a moment. Attorney General called into the white hot light of scrutiny over some serious allegations of discrimination. Anyone want to speak to Sessions for us? This is Andrew Seidel. There's just one point that I would like to touch on for sessions that has just stayed with me. It was a very creepy moment during his confirmation hearing. Shelton Whitehouse, who's a great advocate for secularism and has stood up for this movement a number of times, was questioning him about an article that was talking about going into the Justice Department and purging it of basically secular attorneys. And Jeff Sessions essentially made this sort of quip which indicated that secular people can't understand truth. And I really would encourage people to go watch the video because he has this smug smile on his face as he says this. And it's, it's just a flat out insult to the idea that anybody can be secular. And he says it and has this smug smile and it, you could hear a pin drop in the room. It was completely silent. It fell as flat as could be. And the smile kind of melted from his face. But it, it is a disturbing moment, especially given that they're talking about purging people from a federal government agency, which, you know, the kind of the, the continuity of these agencies depends on these long term employees who stay in regardless of the administration, which, again, kind of goes to what you've been talking about, Seth, the overall dismantling of this. If I could actually just quickly add to what Andrew was saying, you know, we worked really closely at the SCA with the Senate Judiciary Committee staff and providing questions that we really just wanted Jeff Sessions to get on the record about certain issues, because we were so concerned, and this goes exactly to what Andrew was just talking about, to be a secular American, what it means. And during the confirmation of Justice Sotomayor a few years back, you know, he asked questions that really brought up her own integrity as a human being that he was trying to place on religious privilege in this country. And now he is the chief law enforcement officer of the United States. Uh, there's a serious concern that we have with his appointment and that we had with even his nomination. Andrew raises the very good point about that almost sinister smile turned, let me try to be serious for a minute, uh, because it, it, it really just kind of, I think, goes to the heart of what's happening here. And as much as I'd rather we have a different president right now, the idea of having the vice president take over is so much more scary to me from a public policy standpoint than the current president that we have. He led an executive agency in Indiana. He has a track record we can actually follow. And there's not much that we can look at from being an organization that supports First Amendment, free speech, real religious freedom in this country that would point to Mike Pence as saying that he's someone that we would want actually to be guiding the ship. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm concerned about all of this for the next four years, to be honest. I mean, there's there's no two ways around that. Uh, but And if I might jump in, too, this is Steve. We also have Mike Pence's record on the House of Representatives, where he uh, you know, has the distinction of jumping onto the House floor and giving an extended speech denouncing evolution. I mean, Intelligent so we, we design for, provides the only even remotely rational explanation for the known universe. Those are his words. Exactly. I mean, so to have, uh, have that viewpoint elevated to where it is now is frightening, but to the presidency is very frightening for science education. We have to talk about the chief strategist, Steve Bannon, out of Breitbart of all places. Does someone want to get into Steve Bannon here and why he is so terrifying? I think the, you know, I went into this podcast thinking about the importance of science and that the Trump White House seems to be waging this war on science. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that's that's not enough. That's not, that doesn't describe what's going on, because really it's a war on 
on reality and facts. And I think Steve Bannon's position of power and where he came from is just sort of the perfect encapsulation of that. You know, I mean, you have climate change denying evolution, praying for rain, ignoring the fact that vouchers don't work. Evolution is from the devil. Pyramids are used to store grain. Uh, you know, <laughs> everywhere across the board, you look, this is just this anti-reality views put forward, these alternative facts put forward. And I think I think Steve Bannon and coming from Breitbart is kind of a perfect example of that encapsulation of it. This is Andrew Torres. I, I, I think the folks who are making the decisions in the Trump White House, right, Kellyanne Conway and Steve Bannon are it, – it's a double-edged sword how incompetent they are. I mean let's not forget, right, Kellyanne Conway is a third-rate pollster who has been fired from – uh, state legislative campaigns for being a bad pollster, let alone you know capable of making executive level decisions. Steve Bannon is somebody who runs a website that a year ago got fewer hits per month than uh, I don't know than the Thinking Atheist dot com. Right? Like this is <laughs> well, th- I doubt this that. Is, I mean, it's a popular <laughs> website, right? It's it, a, it, it's a popular site. But these are these are not folks who have any competence or ability to make the decisions that they're doing. And so, uh, so for example, I mean, let's take a real world consequence of that. We have it on good authority that with some consultation with Rudy Giuliani, who, uh, well, <laughs> I'll leave the characterization of Rudy Giuliani aside, that Steve Bannon essentially drafted Trump's executive order, the so-called Muslim ban that restricts entry into the United States from seven uh, Muslim majority nations. And that turned out to be a double-edged sword, right? So on the one hand, because it was crafted so overbroad that it applied to individuals with valid green cards with a right of re-entry to this country who happened to be traveling abroad, on the one one hand, that was a good thing because that provided the basis for the TRO that was entered and then upheld. Uh, uh, the, the stay was denied uh, by the Ninth Circuit with respect to that injunction. So it was blocked and forced a reconsideration. So that's a good thing, right? That provided us an opportunity to attack the legality of this executive order, which otherwise is authorized by statute, I'm sad to say. But on the other hand, right, that made the actual lives of hundreds of people significantly worse, right? I mean, we all saw those pictures. Uh, some of us were, you know, on the ground, uh, you know, in airports as people who have a legal right to be in this country were detained. So, you know, on the one hand, the incompetence can uh, help us from a legal perspective. But on the other hand, I mean, you know, those are real people. Those are not just numbers or names to be cited in a brief that uh, uh, suffered in a way that I, I just didn't think was possible in this country. And Trump called it a smooth rollout. And I'm thinking <laughs> that word, I do not think it means what you think it means, right? <laughs> <laughs> but then he attacks the court systems. He calls the judge a so-called judge, right? He's ranting again on Twitter. Is he, is he an enemy of the Constitution? This is yes. Andrew Seidel. I will say yes unequivocally. I, I read this morning. This is this is Larry from the SEA. I read this morning that uh, PRRI, the Public Religion Research Institute, came out with a new study that said 47 percent of Americans actually think he's violated the Constitution. However, not to the degree that he should be impeached. So I I, I don't think it would just be amongst us, and you know certainly not just amongst. Uh, your listeners who would say that he has overstepped his boundaries, but there's a very wide breadth of Americans who think that he has overstepped his boundaries. So, And how much uh, does the Constitution protect us? I mean, is there a point when the sort of steamroller of Donald Trump and the tragic support behind the man becomes enough to override constitutional law? Should we be scared? Well, my fear uh, this is Larry again, uh, is, is essentially that without him, who are we left with? I'm thinking about the long game here. There was a senator this past week who made a comment, you know, basically that said, would I take policy over temperament? And at this point, he would rather see someone like Mike Pence. I'm not sure that I'm there yet. I'm fearful of all of this, and it's not to incite people to do anything extreme. It is to incite people, however, to be a voice for their own government and the way that we need to 
move forward with what we have. We're moving in a direction that is extremely scary. Everything from, you know, the science stuff we've talked about, but also the Johnson Amendment. We're also talking about the Congress tried to intercede last week with a death with dignity bill that had passed the uh, D.C. City Council, of which I'm a constituent. I live in Washington, D.C., and I, you know, I, I support it. I mean, it's all of these things. We've got to look at what we think is our American way of life. You see a big shift in the midterms? I, from a political standpoint, and this is Larry, and I, I'm not trying to occupy the conversation, I promise, but we have a lot more Democratic seats up in the midterms than we do Republican seats. And I think that here's the message I could send. Secular Americans can no longer be spectators to politics. If you have beliefs that you think need to be reflected, you need to get to the polls and you, you need to make sure that your friends and your families are doing the exact same thing and getting out there and voting. We're still being outvoted two to one by evangelicals in this country. And that's it's a shame because we have the same demographic now. Non-religious Americans in this country constitute a full one-fourth of all Americans, the same as evangelicals. They've done a better job coalescing around their issues, and they've done a better job of getting to the polls and getting people like Donald Trump elected. We need to do better going forward. Andrew Torres, do you want to jump in? Secular people are involved, uh, but one of the things that, that we've done pretty poorly, and I want to emphasize this on our side, is we tend to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And we saw yeah. this in the past presidential election. I mean, 100,000 liberals spread across three states, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan, who stayed home, who voted third party, who said, oh, I just wasn't inspired enough by Hillary Clinton. That's the difference in what we face today. And if you could, I'm sure we could find uh, more than 100,000 people in those three states who stayed home uh, who regret that decision. And so what I would say in 2018, uh, to, just to piggyback on, on what Larry said, is yes, get involved. Yes, be excited. But as you're organizing for your preferred candidate in the primary and that candidate loses – Stay involved, right? Go forward. And I, I get it if it's a, you know, quote, corporatist Democrat or, you know, somebody who doesn't quite match up in as many ways. But the problem that we had in this past election of folks on our side who said, if I don't get somebody who lines up with me 100 percent up and down the line, I'm going to stay home is the reason we're here. And it's something that, uh, you know, I, I never take this opportunity to pass up uh, kind of making sure that our, st our side stays energized and focused. Uh, what we need in 2018, Larry is absolutely correct about the state of the Senate map. It is almost all Democratic seats that are in play to make any progress, plus the gerrymandering in the House. Obviously, every House seat comes up every two years. We need a wave election, and a wave election is something like what happened in 2010 at the peak of Tea Party history hysteria, where in 2010, Republicans were favored on the generic congressional right. ballot by 10 points, right? If we get Democrats plus 10 in 2018, we will take back the House and Senate. If we don't, then that will be a mandate for Trump to continue. Steve Newton, you want to jump in? Yeah, well, I think it is very important to um, be involved with things such as the March for Science, which is happening April 22nd, Earth Day. Now, let me and hang on a second. Let me stop sure. you there for just a second. There's a concern, and I don't know that I echo this. I love the idea of a March for Science, mm. but there's a concern about politicizing science. Oh, shit. If you put all these scientists out there, now you've politicized science. What's your take on that criticism? Well, uh, that is certainly a valid concern, uh, and we want to think of science as being, um, you know, the results of science is neutral, but the funding of whether or not we do science, whether or not we respect reality as a, as a framework in which to, to look at questions is, I think, something that, that we need to defend. We, we need to be out there, and if we are going to lose the great research engines that we've had in this country, if we're going to lose university funding in a way that uh, many people are fearful about, I want to at least think that I was on the record saying I oppose that. Yeah. You know, even if we don't win, I think it's important to fight. 
And uh, yeah. things such as the, the upcoming March for Science can be one way to do that. Uh, of course, as was mentioned earlier, directly contracting your representatives rather than online petitions could also be, be something that could have some purchase on this. It's not enough and, to and bitch and about it on Facebook, right? <laughs> it's not enough to it's say, right, this really is enough. an outrage. <laughs> we need to be contacting those who actually are casting the votes. Seth, you keep reminding me that I can swear on this show, which makes me happy. Just knock um, yourself out. It's therapeutic, <laughs> really. <laughs> right? Sometimes. Um, anyway, I, I, I want to piggyback on what Steve just said. You know, the Secular Coalition for America, we are actually very involved in the Science March on Washington on April 22nd, not from the standpoint of trying to politicize anything. But what we want to do is take our expertise as lobbyists and share that with scientists across the country who are coming to Washington to essentially say, let us teach you how to be good advocates. And we're providing them with experience, with all of the tools and resources that we have so that when they go home, they can continue to lobby. And I think that's incredibly important. It's not about making a political statement on science. It's about how do you effectively communicate with your lawmakers? And we need more of that. We need it not just from scientists, people who hold PhDs or master's degrees. We need it from everyday Americans. And what we really want is for as many people possible to come out that respect science, reason, in policy versus ideology or religiosity. We want people to come out and say, I do have a voice and I can make this move forward. After this short break, I'm going to ask my panel about all this buzz on social media that declares the rise of Trump similar to the rise of Adolf Hitler. Are the Hitler analogies accurate and fair? I'm going to talk to the panel about that in just a second. Hang on. Huge thanks out to Stamps.com for being our show sponsor today. I had my car insurance company send me a form that had to be signed via mail. And of course, the postage paid envelope not included. So I just printed it myself in about a minute and I use Stamps.com. I ship stuff out for my book table out to these out-of-state free thought conventions. I print and prep those shipments in my own office and I use Stamps.com. Natalie and I just had a photo album made, finally, of our wedding pictures. And we sent a copy to our officiant, who lives in Alaska. We shipped it to him with Stamps.com. For years, I've used them. Stamps.com has brought all the services of the U.S. Post Office right to my own desk, and they can do the very same thing for you. Buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter, any package, any class of mail using your own computer and printer. Get postage discounts that you can't get at the post office, including three cents off of every first-class stamp. And get the convenience of avoiding the time, travel, and trips to the post office. I use Stamps.com because it saves me time, energy, and money. Right now, you too can enjoy the stamp service with a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus postage and a digital scale without long-term commitments. Go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in Seth Andrews. That's Stamps.com. Enter Seth Andrews. Stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. Joining me for the broadcast today, the broadcast titled Donald Trump's America. I've got Stephen Newton, geologist and a representative for the National Center for Science Education. I've got Larry Decker, the executive director of the Secular Coalition for America. Andrew Seidel, an attorney for the Freedom From Religion Foundation, and Andrew Torres, who's also an attorney and co-host of the broadcast Opening Arguments. So often on social media, I try to resist hyperbole on this show, when it's easy to get into the sort of the hyperbole machine when we're trying to defend a position, when we're passionate about something. It's easy to slip into the extremes. 
But when I see the comparisons between Trump and Hitler, Hitler came to power this way. Hitler was able to diminish the checks and balances, which checked his power in this way. Hitler wasn't Hitler until he was Hitler, those types of things I'm seeing online. It's a warning siren for America. Look out, because we've got one person who is essentially tap dancing all over the Constitution, saying that, quote, I alone can fix it. Those are his words from the 2016 Republican National Convention. He's saying, I'm it. I'm the savior. Is there any merit to the Trump-Hitler comparison? Who wants to jump in on that one? This is Larry. I'll be the guinea pig on this. Um, You know, early on after the president was elected, uh, I reached out to a an, an advisory board member of mine who is considered to be a constitutional scholar, uh, you know, and, and, and she's brilliant. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I said, I really, I, I was taken aback at the way that he attacked. Uh, I'm not going to remember the names and I apologize for it, but you know, the air conditioning plants in Indiana, um, and he attacked, yeah, right. He he ultimately attacked the union boss of the carrier group, and she reminded me in a good way that our fight is not just about protecting our opinion. It's about protecting all opinions. So he has a right to do that, and she's 100 percent right about that. My concern, though, was about the bullying aspect of it. You know, if you're a union leader and you speak out or you say something that's contrary to this president, do you deserve to be attacked on social media by hundreds of thousands of people because he has millions of followers on Twitter and elsewhere? Do you deserve to be attacked in that regard? And I think not. I've never seen a president attack an individual the way that this particular president has. Well, Larry, I'm reminded of the uh, gathering of um, sheriffs at the White House earlier this month, right? And they were talking about asset forfeiture and and, uh, Trump sitting there with a straight face with someone that he disagreed with, a Texas politician. And he said, you know, let's destroy his career. I mean, those words just flew out of his mouth so casually. And I thought, whoa, this is I've never heard. A president speaking exactly. this way. Exactly. But, you know, I mean, at the same time, Seth, we have what we have and we have to deal with what we have. And the individual who commented on all of this, she was 100 percent right, by the way. And, you know, I mean, yes, I have to protect his freedom of speech and his freedom to tweet, if you will, uh, as much as I have to protect my own. And even if I disagree with the message that's coming out. I mean, that that just makes sense. Ultimately, though, and this is where I kind of want to go with it. Americans, me, you, the others on this, this panel, and everyone listening, we have to be brave enough to stand up and be able to accept if one of our tweets or one of our statements calls for some sort of disagreement from the White House or from, you know, this president, we still have to stand up. It's about our own bravery and courage in all of this right now. Anybody else want to speak to the cries of an impending fascist regime? You know, the Hitler thing. Anybody else want to speak to that? Yeah, this is Steve. I'd like to speak to that. Um, well, I actually have degrees in both history and geology, and uh, my history degree specialized in modern Germany. So I've been thinking about this and hearing a lot of people make these comparisons. And I think there's a real danger that we face in uh, sort of coming across as, as seemingly too extreme by making those comparisons. I think people should look at maybe other comparisons to for perhaps Hugo Chavez, maybe Franco. I think there are examples of these sort of strong men coming up in in systems where the the institutions, the courts, the Congress have been weakened. That might be the the better model to think on for uh, talking about this. Andrew Seidel, anything to add? Yeah, I, I like Steve's point there too. I think the Hitler 
analogy is easy to grab at and easy to reach to. But, you know, he is one of the most prolific mass murderers in the history. And to date, we don't know that Donald Trump has done anything like that. He definitely has dictatorial and totalitarian tendencies. And I think you can particularly see that in his tap dancing on the Constitution, as you put it, you know, uh, the violations of the emoluments clause, the attacks on free speech, his promise to roll back libel laws, the undermining of our confidence in voting by claiming there's three million fraudulent votes cast, uh, the attacks on so-called judges and the judiciary, and essentially promising to blame the next terrorist attack on the, the judges in the Ninth Circuit and in Seattle. Uh, so I... <laughs> I think there are definite – he definitely has this totalitarian bent. And you know, Orwell actually wrote – before he wrote 1984, he wrote a letter. And in it, he pointed out that the US and Britain haven't gone totalitarian yet, but that they hadn't really been tested. They hadn't known defeat or severe suffering, but – He pointed out some bad symptoms that he thought might indicate the possibility. And one of those that he pointed out was the general indifference to the decay of democracy. And I think this is what Andrew Torres was talking about earlier, you know, shifting those 100,000 liberal votes. 55.4% of voters did not vote in this presidential election. More people did not vote than voted. That is just disgusting. And hopefully, and I think this might be what you're seeing with town halls around the country, and hopefully it will, that passion will stay alive through the next two and four years. Hopefully we will see people more engaged and actually getting out there and voting now. And I don't think it would even be a contest if everybody in this country voted. I think it would be, it would be a runaway for the progressive, the liberal side of the ballot. Do you agree with those who say that... For citizens, voting should be mandatory. Anybody? I actually do. This is Andrew Seidel. I actually, I do agree with that. I think it should be. And I think if people want to protest by not voting, they can do that and check a box that says I you know, refuse to vote, but I still think they should have to go in and do it. So I, I do agree with mandatory voting. Andrew yeah, Torres, but, what do you think? Yeah, I, I actually disagree with, with mandatory voting. Um, uh, I, I think that that just runs counter to the spirit of, of individual liberty that I think is... Uh, pervasive back to this this country's founding, even the liberty to do something that is, uh, you know, sort of short-sighted and destructive. I tell people all the time, not voting is not a form of protest. You can look at every historical election and no party has ever looked at their raw vote totals or the percentage of not voting and tried to ascertain some meaning from that. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I, I'm shocked we have to learn this lesson again from 2000, right? Like George W. Bush got in in 2000 on the basis of a Supreme Court decision. He lost the popular vote, and by all available evidence, he lost the Electoral College because a recount was stopped in Florida, and a statewide recount would have, would have uh, awarded those votes to Al Gore. And that didn't stop George W. Bush at all, right? So, so you've got a whole culture of people who are proudly brandishing <laughs> their inactivism. My concern, I mean, to sort of head back to the uh, Trump-Hitler question, um, my concern from a structural standpoint is the rise of – what has been dubbed in this administration as alternative facts, uh, but it certainly is not new to Trump. And I worry about democracy, right? Like Orwell, the, the sort of the classic authoritarian books and the Soviet Union throughout the Cold War were premised on the idea that the state could control the instrument of the press, right? And you had Pravda and everything else would be shut That's down. Right. Well, you know, Trump can't force everything other than Breitbart to be shut down. Uh, but, but, what he, but what he can do is disseminate an idea. And this is, uh, you know, my, my uh, co-host just talked to uh, Robert M. Price, who many of you know, a prominent atheist uh, uh, Trump scholar supporter. and Trump yeah. supporter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, and his answers were it just, I mean, they were mind-boggling recitations of talking points. And when he said, well, well what about you know, and would and would put facts before him, he would say, oh, well, that comes from a liberal sort. Well, what about Snopes? Debunk? Well, Snopes is just liberal propaganda. Well, it, it, when, you, when you hit a point with somebody where they say, I will only believe what's reported in Fox News and Breitbart, and Fox News and Breitbart are not interested in reporting facts, to me, that's the problem that I want to solve. Now, right? Trump I, has been hugely successful in getting an entire group, a huge group of people to automatically deflect and say, ah, come on, that's the liberal media uh, it, it that i 
I don't <laughs> – you hear me stuttering a little bit because uh, I don't recall, and I mean that as dramatic understatement, in 2009, 2010 when there were criticisms of Barack Obama related to the Affordable Care Act and – dropping the public option from the Affordable Care Act or drone strikes, failure to shut down Guantanamo, all of the legitimate criticisms of Obama within the first year or two of his presidency, there were no there were no voices on the left that said, oh, well, yeah, but, you know, could you imagine if we had John McCain and John McCain wanted to do it? Like, but, but nevertheless, like you raised with Republicans, I, I, I try it right now, raised with a Trump supporter, did you really want to have a giant $22 billion wall with Mexico? And they'll say, well, could you imagine if Hillary Clinton were president? And, and it's like, your, your guy won, right? Like, <laughs> get, give it up, move on. Uh, and, and, and I just, that, that kind of mindset where, you know, we're locked in a red versus blue, shirts versus skins, I'm rooting for my team and I don't care what the facts are. And to me, that's what I, what I worry about as being deleterious to long-term democracy. Steve Newton? I very much agree that sort of partisanship is something that um, you know our founders certainly didn't take into account parties. That's not not in the Constitution, political parties, and yet it's become very much all party. Washington warned against parties in his farewell address. And uh, Andrew Torres, a nice quote to tie your your ideas together. There is that quote from 1984. The party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was their final, <laughs> most essential command. I love that one. What's interesting Seriously. is I just downloaded 1984 to uh, my audiobook library. The sales of 1984 have skyrocketed here in the year 2017. It's so odd to see this book come back into the public eye in that way. But there seems to be those who lean to authoritarianism. Please take care of me. I'm willing to sacrifice a piece of my own constitutional freedom as long as you give me what... I want or what you think I need. I actually, I just read a really fascinating article on Vox about that very issue. And it talks about people who are prone to sort of accepting authoritarianism. And then there are also people who essentially when they get, when they get scared of the others of, you know, foreigners or something along those lines, that they're, that desire for authoritarianism becomes activated. It was a really, really fascinating article. It's called The Rise of American Authoritarianism, if anybody's interested in it. Yeah, they just say, it's a disaster. Everything's a disaster. It's all a disaster. <laughs> Everything's a disaster, right? I mean, that but, at was the same, but at the same time, I mean, come on, Seth. I mean, I think that people give rise to that when they see someone they trust. Our objective here is to say, you can't. <laughs> You can't trust what's happening right now. Let's do the final thoughts portion of our program, shall we? I mean, just put an exclamation point on it for me. What are your final thoughts? And I'd like to always end with proaction. You know, we've identified the problem, but if there are specifics relating to your organization or another, if there are things you think people should be doing, just hit it one last time for me. I'll start with you, Steve Newton from the National Center for Science Education. What do you think, man? Well, despite a lot of the, the despair that uh, people I know are feeling about this, I think despair, in a way, is, is, a, is a prophecy. You're saying you know how it's all going to turn out. I think, looking at the longer term, that there's hope, and especially that hope comes from the reaction people have had in this month and the very strong defense of science and education that I'm seeing from many people. So we're going to have some bad years, but then my hope is we will have some good ones. Andrew Seidel from the Freedom From Religion Foundation. What do you think, man? I think this administration has a virulent strain of anti-secularism in it. FFRF, the Freedom From Religion Foundation, is doing our best to fight it. We've actually tangled with a lot of the people in this administration already. We sued Rick Perry over him organizing a prayer rally and promoting it from the governor's office. Uh, I went up against Scott Pruitt for him defending a public school that was distributing Bibles to its students. So we've, we've dealt with Ben Carson. We've, we've had these fights before. We know we're going to have a lot more of these fights in the future, but we've got five staff attorneys and two legal fellows, and we are here to fight like hell for you. And if that's important to you, people should join FFRF. We don't just need the membership dues. We also need the numbers. <laughs> We need you know, to be able to say we're representing 30,000, 50,000 people. It really does have an impact. You know, if they relocate Ben Carson, is he going to bring all those oil paintings of himself from the mansion? And, you know, is he going to rehang them in the new place? I was curious. I, the, 
that painting of him and Jesus and where, like, they had just had their spa day together. <laughs> it's just... I kind of want a copy of it. It's awesome. <laughs> it's awesome. Andrew Torres, co-host of the Opening Arguments podcast. Final thoughts from you. Yeah, I endorse all the organizations that are on this show. I think my role in this is much more modest. Um, what I try and do with my show is to try and help people take that energy and become informed about developments that have a legal component. And I would say, you know, the the, the lesson I try and, and drive home is uh, left or right. When you see the clickbaity headlines, you know, look through, read the original legal documents if you if you listen to our show we'll help you out with that but try and and take I'm really really mad and turn that into I'm mad I know why I'm mad and this is what I'm going to do about it in a productive and efficient way you know, for an attorney, you're a pretty good guy, Andrew. I just want oh, to throw thanks. that out there. I mean, you're okay. Um, Larry Decker from the Secular Coalition for America. Final thoughts, sir. You know, right now, what we really need are people who are going to be responsive, who are going to be right on the dot when things come out. Uh, that's kind of what we're creating with our rapid response team Anyone can sign up for secular.org email announcements or our action alerts and all of that sort of stuff. But what we really need are people who are so committed that if they get a text message, they're going to react to it immediately. And they can do so through the Rapid Response Network. Andrew's right, by the way, uh, Seidel uh, at FFRF. You know, to essentially say that what we need are citizen activists and what we're willing to do is train citizen activists so that, you know, they may think that who am I to respond to this issue or that issue? We'll give you the tools, the resources, the necessary things that you need to do it, but we need people to engage I'm going to include links to the National Center for Science Education, the Secular Coalition of America, the Freedom from Religion Foundation, and the Opening Arguments podcast in the description box so anybody can easily click and link to those resources. Tomorrow I'm releasing a Secular State of the Union address. The speech itself is going to speak about the secular framework of America, and we've all heard the God and country narrative, our founding fathers were Christians narrative, one nation under God, in God we trust. We're surrounded by this sort of you know, theocratic America speak. And uh, so the speech tomorrow is going to address that and sort of be, instead of a top-down presentation, it's going to reverse the looking glass where a private citizen, a secular citizen, speaks about the State of the Union. So that's happening tomorrow. And then a video is releasing just for Christian Trump supporters on Wednesday. So I've got a big trifecta of Trump coming up. Uh, Steve Newton, Andrew Seidel, Andrew Torres, Larry Decker, thank you so much for being a part of the broadcast and the panel for your perspective and your time. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Seth. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com.